the time where I entered the hangar, I witnessed uh, recovered alien spacecraft that uh, the Department of Naval Intelligence in the United States was back engineering. He was a U.S. Federal Marshal, and he was sent into the area to pick up a man, a fugitive. Uh, when he got to the gate at, at Groom Lake, uh, he, they, 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 they let him on to make the arrest, but they required an escort with him. And then first they searched him, and then they, they assigned an escort, and, and when they prepared to leave, the escort handed him a, a black bag. He says, put it in your belt here because if, when they, if a siren sounds, we pull the bag over our head and lay down on the ground face down and wait till there's an all clear. He says there are, are, are things here that are, are very secret and, and they can't be seen. So the man says, well, what happens if somebody looks up? If, if you don't stay down there, they said they're shot on the spot and ask questions afterwards. I have uh, had the opportunity over the years to interview, again, people who have worked at the test site at Groom Lake. Uh, one gentleman, spent 12 of his 30 years in black programs at Groom Lake. When I asked him, I said, uh, first of all, I said, do you believe in UFOs? And he looked at me with a straight face in one on one and said, absolutely, positively, they do exist. I said, can you expand upon that? And he said, no, I can't. About a year later, we were talking about, again, activities at Groom Lake. And I asked him, I said, you know, can, can, can you really let me tell me what's happening out there and he said well there's a lot of things that are going on there that i won't be able to tell you until until the year 2025 but we have things in the nevada desert that would make george lucas envious we are here at one of the most mysterious places on earth behind these mountains begins the black world the super secret u.s navy and air force test site known as area 51 Rumors say that right here to test flights with craft from another world recovered by the military take place. In this film, we investigate these rumors and were, at the end, able to observe one of those mysterious UFOs by ourselves. Right here, near the black mailbox at the desert road to Groom Lake. This is a Nevada test site. The area comprises about 10,000 square miles. It's bordered on the south by uh, Mercury and on the um, west side by Highway uh, 95 and up here on the uh, northwest by Tonopah and across the top to Crystal Springs and down here to Las Vegas. This area right here is the uh, Department of Energy uh, Nuclear Underground Testing Area with all their areas labeled there. Uh, this is called the uh, Yucca Strip. Uh, up here is the Tonopah test range where the F-117 used to fly out of and now there's other secret programs going on up there. This uh, area all across the north here is used for the red flag exercises which is the Air Force equivalent to the Navy's Top Gun exercises. They come out of Nellis Air Force Base here and fly this whole area. Right dead center of the test site is what is known as Area 51, uh, also known as Watertown, also known as the Ranch. Uh, at the very center is Groom Lake. It's about 10 miles on each side, and this is where uh, most of the secret activity goes on. Just 10 miles south of the Groom Lake's complex is an even more secret area. This is where the uh, saucers, the disks, are flown, an area called S4. There's nine hangars inside the mountain, and the disks are flown up the Emigrant Valley, uh, up in this area. They're flown like that. And this is where they can be seen from this road, Mailbox Road, which is right here. It's about uh, 14 miles uh, from there to where you see the disks. Up in this area up here is the Tonopah test range and one of the workers up there at this lake right here one day saw a big door open on the in the dry bed of the lake and a disk come out of there. 
Area 51 was uh, basically a, a, a Navy training base until 1955 when, uh, in conjunction with uh, the CIA, Lockheed made a secret test base out of it. Uh, and the reason was to test the U-2. Uh, in 1959, 60, and 61, they also tested the SR-71 out of there. And it became a, a perfect uh, area in which to test secret equipment and secret airplanes. So it was because it was so remote, it was bounded on all sides by mountains, and uh, it was essentially a million miles from nowhere. The security that it provided was just exactly what they needed. Um, in the after 1960, uh, it became a uh, area to test not only planes. Uh, but equipment, uh, uh, machinery, all kinds of secret things that they had. Uh, in 1972, uh, there is, according to my research, a complete blackout of detailed information, records, what have you, for a period of 18 months. Nobody knows what happens between the summer of 82 and uh, I think it was January, uh, or, no, summer of uh, 72 in January of uh, 74. There's absolutely no records. They talk to security guards. They don't know what happened there. I don't know what happened there. Uh, I don't really have any uh, suspicions because um, the Flying Saucer program uh, began, Project Red Light began, it's my information, in earnest at Groom Lake in 1960. Uh, they did attempt to fly uh, one or two of the craft. There was a major accident and the testing operations shut down for a number of years. Uh, the testing operations began in earnest again, I believe in 1980, 81, 82, around that area. And the reason I say that is because the security increased drastically uh, during that period. And uh, I believe that uh, just south of Groom Lake, which uh, is in the northeast corner of, uh, of the Nevada test site, uh, is a place called Papoose Lake. It's a dry lake. Uh, there's a secret area there called S4, and I believe that that's where they test the saucers out of. Uh, my sources uh, are varied, uh, but the primary source being Bob Lazar, who worked on uh, one of the nine saucers that were stored there. Colonel Stevens, um, you investigated rumors about the top secret flying saucer investigation project in Area 51. Yes, the rumors became a little more real to me in about 1978 when I discovered my first participant in the changeover of that base to a very special facility where they took up the runway and laid in underground facilities and special laboratories and then relayed it and recon reconstructed the base to make it look just like it did before. The material that is now stored at Area 51, uh, I believe, came from the Roswell, Roswell crash in 1947, a crash at Aztec, New Mexico in 1948, and another crash down along the Mexican border in about 1949 or 50. Uh, the residue was first taken to Los Alamos and to uh, other areas in New Mexico under the control of the Atomic Energy Commission, also super, super secret facilities. They were smaller, and I believe that the real facility was constructed at Area 51 when they modified, when they changed over Groom Field to, uh, it, was, it was a field on a dry lake bed, when they changed it over to become a special research facility. And I believe they transported the material that had been collected and held elsewhere to Area 51 about that time, at least much of it, for the research projects. Now that, that uh, changeover came and began in about 1948, 47 or 48, probably early 48, when they modified the field, changed over the building and the facilities and put in a habitat where they could control an atmosphere for extraterrestrial gas is my supposition now. And they also put in laboratories for research. And it's been expanded, been worked and expanded almost since that time. You got confirmation from the military, didn't you? Yes, uh, one in particular comes to mind. Now, he's not in the military, but he ran uh, several large military research programs here in Nevada. Uh, very top level programs, uh, the highest classification. This is a person of, from a very prominent Nevada family, 
uh, well known, it's provable where he worked and the kinds of things that he did. He, he also confirms that the, the alien technology has been in Nevada since the early 1950s, that it was, uh, it was even here before the base at Groom Lake was built, uh, that one of the reasons that the Groom facility was built is in order to test this alien technology. He told me that there was a live alien in custody for a number of years, uh, that they had uh, difficulty communicating with the alien at first, but eventually developed some sort of a communication uh, abilities. He, uh, he is reluctant to talk. He's worried about what will happen to his family, but he has agreed to give me a videotaped deposition that would be released only after his death. And I think when that comes out, it will not only confirm what Bob Lazar had to say, but shed a great deal of light on what our military, what our government has known about the alien presence for the past 45 years, including Roswell. Las Vegas, Nevada, city of gambling, city of the thousand lights, and what only a few know, gate to a world full of military secrets. Here we started our investigation into the mysteries of the black world. Because behind the mountains, north to the glitter town, begins the Nevada test site. Nearly a state by its own. Surrounded by borders safer than any other border on Earth since the Iron Curtain came down. Nuclear weapons are tested here. The stealth fighter was hidden here. And much more exotic planes are flown today. Our quest brought us to John Lear, one of the most successful and experienced pilots in the United States. The son of the legendary airplane designer William P. Lear has flown in over 16,000 hours, more than 160 different types of aircraft in over 50 different countries, holds 17 world speed records and is the only pilot ever to hold every airman certificate issued by the Federal Aviation Administration. Since the Vietnam War, he has flown missions worldwide for the CIA and other government agencies, as well as many different experimental planes for the Navy and Air Force. Other insiders have told Lear about the secret UFO test flights in Area 51. But in 1988, these rumors became reality for him after he met a young nuclear physicist, Robert Lazar. In the summer of 1988, um, I was having this house appraised. And the appraiser brought along, who was very, the appraiser was interested in UFOs, and he brought along uh, a friend of his, uh, who was a scientist, former scientist at Los Alamos. Um, the appraiser, being interested in UFOs, wanted the opinion of this scientist on UFOs. And at that time, I was doing a lot of lecturing. There was a lot of um, uh, publicity about me and UFOs in the summer of 88. Uh, so I met this gentleman, uh, Bob Lazar, uh, and he didn't believe it at all. He told me that he worked at Los Alamos on SDI. He worked. Uh, he had a Q clearance. Uh, he had uh, a number of other compartmentalized clearances. He he uh, he knew a lot of secret things. He said that if there had been something like this, some cover up, that he would have known about it. So over the next uh, three or four months, uh, we got to know Bob very well. He got to know us, and we passed him various information, uh, which he checked out with the people that he knew that still worked at Los Alamos, specifically uh, people who had access to the classified library. Uh, I told him that Project Grudge, which the Air Force told us, uh, told the public was canceled in 1949, was still active. He was able to determine through his friends uh, who had access to the classified library at Los Alamos that it was still going on. Uh, there was another thing that uh, uh, I had mentioned that the one of the aliens that uh, we had captured were kept at a secret place called a YY-2 facility. Uh, he, in fact, found out that there was a classified mail stop at Los Alamos called YY-2. Now, that doesn't mean it would, they kept aliens there, but it, it showed that I knew secret things that were going on. There was enough evidence there that, that he thought, well, maybe there is something to this, and he wanted to find out. So having uh, the specialized, uh, uh, highly 
uh, educated uh, person that he was, he held two degrees, uh, master's degrees from MIT, and also knowing Dr. Keller, who was the father of the H-bomb, he was able to send his resume to Dr. Teller, who then called him and uh, uh, asked him where he wanted to work. Dr. P Teller proposed two places, either eg and in Las Vegas or Lawrence Livermore Laboratories in California. Bob said, I want to work at Area 51. Uh, he didn't tell Dr. Teller the reason, but he wanted to get as close as he could to where we thought the saucer testing was going on. Well, during the next uh, six weeks after that, uh, he was contacted by eg and uh, he was given three security interviews uh, and three interviews on his uh, basic knowledge. Uh, they were so impressed that, uh, that apparently uh, they went ahead and hired him. The first thing that I knew is on December 6, 1988, Bob came up here as he usually did in the evening. I was sitting here writing checks and he sat right in that seat and I said, what's going on, Bob? And he said, I saw a disc today. And I said, I was so startled, I thought I didn't hear him right. I said, what? And he said, I saw a disc today. And I said, theirs or ours? And he said, theirs. And I said, you went to the test site? He said, yeah, I just got back. This is the first time I went up there. I said, oh, my God. I said, well, what are you doing here? I said, don't jeopardize your security clearance. Work up there for a while and find out what's going on. He said, he said no. He said, you've taken so much flack over this thing people not believing you, I'm going to tell you exactly what I saw. And for the next three hours and 47 minutes, he proceeded to tell me exactly what he saw on his first trip up to S4 at the Nevada test site. And basically it was that, yes, we had nine extraterrestrial vehicles. He told me a little bit about the power plants. He told me that he'd been briefed on the aliens that flew them. He told me that he'd, he'd been briefed on a number of other secret things. Um, he told me that uh, we, in fact, did have a secret base on the moon. He told me that we, in fact, did uh, have a secret base on Mars. Uh, a number of things, some of which were so unbelievable. It was, it, had I not known Bob uh, to be truthful, I would have been very suspect. But uh, I had known him for this period of time, and I had no reason to, to believe that uh, he would tell me anything other but the truth. Well, I had met Ed Teller at Los Alamos one day. Uh, we had a brief meeting and a, and a talk. Uh, I had shortly thereafter moved to Las Vegas and basically left the scientific community to do other work. Uh, Some time later I decided to re-enter and send applications out to several other national labs and also one to Ed Teller and he uh, gave me a call and he said uh, he might have something that I'd be interested in and suggested uh, that I go for an interview. Uh, shortly thereafter, someone from EG&G called and told me to come down for an interview there. Uh, they made it very clear that EG&G had nothing to do with it. They were just using the building as a place to do the interview. After a short time, they said I was basically overqualified for the position, but they may have something else in the future. And I don't remember how much time lapsed after that but uh, shortly thereafter, they asked me to come down for another interview, and uh, they said this was involving, uh, I don't remember their exact wording, but they led me to believe it was uh, a field propulsion system, and of course I thought it was something that, in secret, that we were working on. Uh, later, only did I find out that it was uh, you know, a back engineering program dealing with alien craft. I flew out of Las Vegas McCarran Airport and I flew to Groom Lake in a 737 aircraft. We land at Groom Lake and there's a bus there that drives about 15 miles south approximately, I'm, I'm really not sure exactly how far, uh, down to a smaller dry lake bed known as Papoose Lake. And right up against the side of the mountain is the uh, S4 installation. And what happened to you first when you entered it? How uh, did they receive you? Uh, it was very military-like. It was uh, certainly not a scientific atmosphere. Uh, very high security. Everywhere you, you walked, you had to have an escort, an armed escort, even, even into the bathroom. Uh, all doors lock and open with your, uh, with your badge. And uh, 
it was a very oppressive atmosphere. Um, how many times uh, did you spend on this atmosphere before you saw the craft for the first time? Uh, I believe I was only there two or three days, probably two days before I saw the craft. Time, how they are stored, what your impression was, and, and your feelings when you saw it. Well, my feelings, it was very, uh, um, I should step back a minute and say that when I first saw the craft the first time, it was walking into the hangar, and uh, my impression was, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. This is just a secret military aircraft we're working on, and that's the end of that. It was actually the second time when I saw the craft, when I got to enter it and look over it, and I finally realized what was going on, that this is an alien craft. And, of course, this was after I read the briefings. And uh, that was a totally different feeling. That was not a feeling of excitement. It was a, almost a, a, an ominous feeling, that uh, a feeling as if you shouldn't even be there. It's very difficult to describe. How did it look like? It looked like, uh, if anyone's familiar with uh, Billy Myers' uh, sightings, very astonishingly similar to that, uh, that craft. It was uh, a very sleek, thin-looking, uh, flying saucer-shaped craft. Uh, kind of hard to describe without drawing it, but uh, kind of a, a typical flying saucer shape. Did you um, see just one type or different types? There were nine total. Uh, I only got to essentially work, back engineer, or analyze one of the craft. But there was a separate hangar for each of the crafts, and uh, each one was essentially different uh, in its visual appearance. Did anybody tell you where the um, U.S. Navy intelligence got the craft from? No. No, not at all. That's, uh, you know, a lot of people have speculated about it, that they were either shot down or they crashed. Uh, but uh, the craft seem undamaged, so I doubt either of those would be correct. Can you describe the inside of an alien craft? It's very plain. It's all one solid color, uh, a, a grayish pewter color, the same color as the outside of the craft. Yeah, there are no sharp corners anywhere. Every device in the craft, the seat, uh, the amplifier housings, everything has a rounded corner on it, almost as if it was all fashioned out of wax and then slightly melted so everything curved, even where the ceiling meets the floor on the end. Everything has a, a curve to it. Um, very, very plain, very wide open, uh, very impractical use of space. And there are three levels. The lower level, um, houses the amplifiers themselves that swing, the three of them. The center level is where you enter the craft, where the seats and the amplifiers are, and the uh, top level is a small area, and I did not have access to that, so I don't know what's up there. Do you think they're alien craft or U.S. constructed? Uh, absolutely alien craft. There's no question about it. Why? Well, first of all, the scope of the project was to back engineer it. If they were United States craft, we wouldn't be going backward trying to find out how they were built if we had built them. Uh, second of all, the size of uh, the equipment inside, the size of the seats, the uh, materials that were in use, completely alien to us, pardon the pun, and uh, you know the fuel, element 115, essentially non-existent. Uh, all these factors together, uh, and of course the briefing information stating that they were alien craft. Um, could anybody tell you how the propulsion functioned? Well, that was part of my job, was to back engineer that and uh, find out exactly how that operated. And they had made some progress, but uh, I really don't know how long the craft was, was there being analyzed, uh, if it was one year or ten years before I got there, but it seems like uh, only a modest amount of progress had been made. The propulsion system is really an amazing setup. Uh, there's two parts, there's gravity amplifiers uh, and the reactor that provides the power. The reactor itself is a, a total annihilation reactor uh, fueled by antimatter. 
total annihilation is essentially the most efficient uh, nuclear reaction that takes place of the three, fission, fusion, and uh, annihilation. It uses a super heavy element, element 115, uh, as it would appear on the periodic chart. None has yet been synthesized on Earth. Um, it's my opinion that this occurs naturally in, in certain star systems. This element is bombarded in a, an extremely small accelerator. Uh, the element under bombardment uh, undergoes spontaneous fission and produces uh, antimatter particles. These are interacted with a gaseous matter target and by means of a 100 percent efficient uh, thermoelectric device is converted uh, into electricity. Now a hundred percent efficient uh, any electric de device is essentially impossible. Uh, you know, the first law of thermodynamics says that's basically impossible. There has to be waste heat and things of that sort, but there's none detected in, in this system. It's uh, another amazing form of technology. Uh, this uh, tremendous amount of power the system generates uh, operates the amplifiers and also as a byproduct of the 115 undergoing uh, uh, this bombardment, it produces uh, a very interesting phenomena, a gravity A wave as it's known to be called. Uh, this gravity A wave is, uh, it travels in um, almost the same way microwaves travel. Uh, this is essentially applied to the gravity amplifiers and by means of the electric current also provided by the reactor, it's amplified and focused. Uh, the amplified signal is shift, shifted slightly out of phase and, and by virtue of that they can repel or attract uh, a gravitational body. The craft can take off on one gravity amplifier. There are three in this particular craft. Uh, when it's using just one amplifier, essentially push, pushing away from the Earth, it's known as Omicron configuration. For space travel, the craft will rotate up on its side, face the three gravity amplifiers at the target. They'll focus down on a single point uh, some tremendous distance away, and the amplifier and uh, the associated uh, and the reactor, the associated reactor, will be run up to full power and uh, they essentially pull the fabric of space, distort space and time toward the craft, so they can traverse a tremendous amount of distance in, in virtually no time at all. They're not traveling in a linear fashion. They're essentially bending space and s space, the fabric of space, essentially, and gravity and time are all interlaced. Uh, when you start distorting gravity, you distort time and space along with it. And these, are, these aren't theories. We've known these for a while. We just have no way of controlling them. But apparently the civilization has found out how. Um, did you manage, uh, did you people manage to fly one? They've done several test flights in it now, not out of the atmosphere. Uh, these are short, controlled, low-altitude flights. Uh, essentially, they have a prized position here, so they're not going to risk taking this to a point uh, where they could potentially lose it as, uh, you know, at the gravitational pull of the Earth or going too high. But uh, I witnessed several tests um, outside the compound and uh, also one, you know, probably about 100 feet away from the craft. How did the craft behave in the flight? Very, very quietly. It, it lifted off, it, it made a slight hissing sound, uh, a slight uh, blue glow from the bottom, probably due to the uh, extreme voltage that's present on the craft. Um, after a short time that, that disappeared as it uh, rose and uh, just gently glided and later sat down, it uh, was very uneventful, but uh, almost totally silent. Um, can you please describe the briefing documents and the information contained in it? Uh, it was, there were an extensive amount, 120 some odd uh, briefing documents, all of them very short. And uh, essentially what they were doing was just giving me an overview of the other aspects of the research being done on the craft. and. The bulk of the information, all the technical information, was specifically dealing with the power and propulsion system, which is what I was supposed to be working on. 
but there were documents uh, uh, basically stating that uh, these were aliens that possessed the craft. There were some autopsy reports that, uh, not very in-depth, they had no reason to give me in-depth reports on that, but uh, they did have pictures and, uh, uh, well, two pictures actually of the alien carcass with the chest cut open and a single organ removed and the organ itself was uh, sectioned. Uh, it seemed to, from my non-medical viewpoint, uh, it seemed that this one organ performed uh, many functions instead of one. Um, there were documents on uh, metallurgical work being done on the craft and uh, really every aspect uh, that separate groups were working on. And I'm sure they got a briefing on what my group was working on, a very abbreviated one, as uh, I did on theirs. And this will say where the aliens come from? Yeah, it did mention the Zeta Reticuli system and uh, how that information was extracted from the craft, I don't know, maybe there were star charts or something along those lines. Did they contain any information about the um, history of mankind, the alien involvement in the history of mankind? Not. Not really. Not, nothing that said, well, this is the way things were. Uh, there, there, there was mention of um, um, alien intervention uh, in, in the past, I mean, it, it, extremely long ago. Uh, something along the lines of uh, I have millions of years ago. Uh, from the information that, that I looked at, it, it seemed that, uh, and there again, these are briefing documents, so I can't, I, I can't myself ascertain whether or not these are true. I can only assume it because the briefing documents I read that pertain to the propulsion system were true because I, I dealt with that. But uh, they did make reference to uh, uh, contact with the Earth over 10,000 years ago, uh, also with... Uh, uh, genetic alterations that ended in uh, uh, a simian being and uh, all kinds of uh, claims. Did you ever meet um, an alien or an alien body? Other than in pictures, no. I've uh, mentioned several times that I'd walk through an area and looked in a small window and saw something small there, but I don't, I, I really can't say that was an alien body. A lot of people jump on that and say, yeah, you must have seen an alien, but uh, there's just as much chance that they were trying to figure out the size difference and how the, the seats fit a body and, you know, they had made up a small mannequin or something. I didn't see anything moving around alive. So uh, I, I always say, no, I, I have never seen a living alien. What do you think you were chosen for, for the job? That's very difficult to say. I, I really I really don't know. I'm certainly not the most qualified as far as physics goes. Uh, so I really don't know. I've, I approach things at a very different viewpoint. Uh, they might have been frustrated after a long time of walking down the same path and not getting anywhere, and they wanted someone essentially to come out of left field and approach it from a different angle with a different viewpoint, and uh, I'm kind of known for that. Why did you went public with the information? When? Why? Why? Uh, that's, again, a, a complex question. It's not just one reason. There's several uh, stemming from, from many things. Harassment, uh, to protect myself, the fact that this information being contained is, is also unfair. But there are many, many reasons. After you went public, did they try to silence you in any way? Oh, in every way. Yes, I was uh, uh, shot at while getting on the freeway here in Las Vegas. Uh, friends were harassed and taken out of work that, that knew me. Uh, uh, many things happened. Well, he was, uh, he was upset about the security at, at the base. It was an, an oppressive place to work. He was upset that they didn't have better scientists and a more open kind of research that would allow them to finally get to the bottom of how this alien technology worked. He thought that that information should be shared with the entire world in order to benefit the entire world. At the same time, he was going through some personal crises uh, that, uh, that, may, that led to him sharing some of this information with some people that he knew. Once he got caught, 
He was worried about his safety. Uh, they put guns to his head. Uh, they told him he was in a heck of a lot of trouble. And I think the reason he was willing to talk to me, at least what he told me in the beginning was, he was trying to save his, his hide. He figured by going public that they wouldn't dare do something to him. Uh, it seems to me that, that for several months there, after he was talking to me, there were serious attempts to intimidate him, to keep him quiet, uh, but he had the courage to pursue it. And I think he made the right decision because I'm not sure that he would be alive today if he had not spoken to the television camera. Michael, I was in Las Vegas television for 10 years. I worked stories about uh, political corruption, organized crime, illegal drugs. I've never done a story anything like this. Uh, when I first met Bob Lazar, I was only tangentially interested in the UFO material. I had done some talk shows about it. I knew the public was interested in it, but I didn't know if I was going to be able to do the story about Area 51. Uh, stories about Area 51 and possible alien technology there had been floating around for as long as I had lived in Las Vegas, but there had never been any thorough investigation, primarily because no one who had inside knowledge of the program had ever been willing to talk about it publicly uh, until Bob Lazar. Uh, when I met Bob, uh, I, I, I had a meeting with him and my news director. We, uh, we asked him a lot of questions. We asked him the basics of his story. It obviously is a fantastic story, but we decided to go forward with it because Bob himself seemed so credible. It, it became very difficult very soon, however, because uh, trying to verify Bob's background proved extremely difficult. It is still uh, proving extremely difficult. For example, we quickly found out that the schools that he said he went to had no records that he was ever there. Uh, his former employers, where he said he worked, had no records that he'd ever been there. In particular, Los Alamos National Lab was the linchpin of, of his credibility. We thought if we could prove that he worked at Los Alamos, as he said, it must have meant that he went to school somewhere because they don't just hire people off the street. And if he worked at Los Alamos National Lab on classified material, it made sense that he could have been hired to work at other classified programs, such as S4, Papoose Lake. Uh, however, the people at Los Alamos Lab said they had no records that he'd ever been there. They stalled on our requests for information. Um, they, uh, they wouldn't return phone calls. They wouldn't answer letters. It was as if they didn't want us to have the answers. Well, eventually, we came up with a lot of indications that Bob did work there. We found, for example, the, the newspaper from Los Alamos that lists him as being a physicist from the lab. We found the, the lab laboratory telephone book that lists him as being an employee at the lab. We have talked to other people at the lab who worked with him, who tell us that Bob did work on classified projects, that he was a, a physicist, that he was there. Just this week, almost four years, after we first started making our inquiries at Los Alamos, we finally got someone from the lab to say, yes, Bob Lazar was here. Yes, he worked at the Mason facility. Yes, that facility did some classified work. It's taken a long time, but now we know that Bob was there. We know he had a security clearance, uh, but we still know that there are a lot of the records that we're searching have not been produced for us. We don't know why. What convinced you most that Bob Lazar told you the truth? Well, I, I'm not 100% sure about everything that he says, because as journalists, we have to be somewhat skeptical. Uh, but a couple of things stand out in my mind. Number one is that Bob has always told the same story. The story that he told me on the first day that I met him about his experiences at S4 is the same story he tells today. And most importantly, when Bob got into some legal trouble, which in, in the eyes of many people means that he's completely discredited. When he got into his legal trouble, he told the court system the exact same thing. Now, the, the, the courts, the interesting thing is, they're trying to verify his background, uh, the probation department, and they said, we can't verify his background, therefore he should go to prison. Well, my response to it is, welcome to the club. You can't get any information on his background. Bob was facing up to 60 years in prison if he did not tell the truth about his background, and the story that he told to the court is the same story that he told to me on the first day and the same story that he's telling today. After you interviewed Lazar on TV, did you come in contact with other witnesses from Area 51? Several witnesses, uh, more than a dozen now in, in total, have come forward with bits and pieces of information that confirm at least parts of what Bob said. No one has come forward with the kind of broad knowledge that he claimed, 
uh, but what I have learned from these other people uh, tends to confirm that what Bob is saying is true. The problem is that none of them have been willing to talk publicly. They will give me bits and pieces of information privately, uh, but uh, I'm restricted from using their names. And there's some very good reasons for that. There's been an obvious attempt to intimidate the, these witnesses into keeping their mouths shut. But three examples come to mind. One is a, uh, a former electrical engineer who worked in the television business, who moved uh, from Las Vegas and whom I worked with, moved to another city. He had told me by phone that he had seen a disc under a tarp in a building at Groom Lake. Well, I, I tried to arrange to do an interview, long distance interview, um, with, with a camera crew in the city where he lives. He agreed to do it as long as I blacked out his face. He comes out the morning after he makes the agreement to, uh, to give me this interview. There's a car sitting in front of his, his house, two men in suits speaking into a radio. He's not giving it much of a thought, but they followed him to work. When he gets out of work, they followed him home. No interview, he was scared. There's a woman who works in the court system here in Las Vegas in a very responsible position who formerly worked for a major defense contractor here in Nevada. She had sat in on meetings where she said the discussion between her employer and military officials was about wreckage from Roswell, which had been taken to Area 51, alien wreckage. She had agreed to give me this information in a private meeting that we were going to have but the day that the meeting was supposed to happen, she didn't show up. And I found out later she'd been visited by her former employers, and they had told her she's still under oath, she could be prosecuted. But what's more, uh, her employers hinted that harm could come to this woman or her family if she talked to me. They said, we know you do a lot of traveling. We'd hate for accidents to happen to you or your family. So she will still not talk to me now three years later. Uh, there was a third example, this man who performed the tax returns of persons who worked at Area 51. He had called me up on the phone at the, at the TV station and told me he would meet and give me this information. Uh, the next day, he's visited by two men who say that they're from the Secret Service and they wanted to ask him about his tax returns, uh, but he said that it was his definite impression they didn't care about his tax returns, they just wanted him to shut up and not talk about Area 51. Uh, so there are a lot of people like that uh, who have information, who could confirm Bob Lazar's story if they had the courage to come forward. I can't really blame them for not coming forward because uh, uh, our government or elements of our government or representatives of our government seem to use intimidation and fear tactics to keep these people quiet. The only evidence that we got is uh, we were able uh, to steal or otherwise obtain a piece of the fuel that powers uh, the saucers. Um, it was element 115, uh, it's a stable element, and we did several experiments uh, with this. We also videotaped these experiments. Uh, the experiment was to prove the high gravitational attraction, the, the heaviness of the element, and other things. Um, we proved it to ourselves. Unfortunately, whoever is in charge of the cover-up stole it back. The other thing was that uh, on, May, on March uh, 21st, 1989, he asked me if I wanted to view one of the test flights. This was on a Tuesday, and I said, well, sure, but how are we going to see one? And he said, uh, there's going to be a test flight tomorrow night uh, just at sunset, and uh, I know a place where we can sneak in, still be on public land, and watch it. And I said, great. So um, I said, why at sunset? And he said, well, statistically, uh, up in that area, there's the least traffic ar around then. So I drove with Bob and uh, the real estate appraiser, Gene Huff, and myself, and we drove up there, got there just a little bit before, before sunset. I took my Celestron telescope, we took a video camera, uh, got out of the uh, car, and within maybe 10 or 15 minutes, this disc comes up from behind the mountains and starts doing all these fantastic maneuvers. Uh, it was a light, a very bright light, and you couldn't see the disc form. But I had my Celestron scope with me, which is uh, 8 inches, extremely powerful, and after a few minutes I was able to get it right in the, the uh, finder of the Celestron telescope, and I saw for myself it was a disc. There was no question in my mind, and I just watched it go down behind the mountains. We had heard about this location, and actually the, ultimate, the information ultimately had come from John Lear, we found out. We heard about the 29 and a half mile marker, the famous mailbox area. So we went up there, our first trip was the first Saturday in January of 1990. 
And we arrived there about 10.30 at night, and while we didn't see anything on that trip, it was a Saturday night, we found out that the active nights are Monday through Friday, and the weekends are usually shut down. But what we did find out, there were several other vehicles up there, three motorhomes and a couple of passenger cars, and talking with those people, we found out that they, having had gone out there on numerous other occasions, had seen plenty. So we were determined that, and we had understood from the beginning, that this was going to be something where on one night you would see nothing, and on the next night all hell might break loose. So we were prepared for the long haul. We were going to continue going out there until we should eventually see something. So <clears throat> then upon returning back home, I discovered that I could tune in the Billy Goodman happening out of Las Vegas in Santa Monica. I could receive it. So I started listening, and almost the first night, <clears throat> Bob Lazar was being interviewed by Billy Goodman. And I in listened intensely. And I discovered from Lazar's interview that the best nights to go out there are Wednesday nights, that they pull out most of the stops on Wednesday nights. Now the reason for that was explained that when they were preparing this facility and the operation, they did a study on Highway 375, the public highway through the action zone, Tickaboo Valley. And they determined from their study that there was the least traffic on Wednesday nights on Highway 375. So that's why Wednesday nights were chosen <clears throat> for most of the action. Although we, on, in having made numerous other trips, determined that almost any weeknight is effective, Monday through Friday. But Wednesdays always seems to be the most prolific, probably for that reason. <clears throat> but then, of course, we wondered that since we were going out there on a Wednesday night, Maybe that would perturb the formula, and then, of course, it would shift to some other weeknight. Who knows? So, but still, nevertheless, it seems that Wednesday nights still continue to dominate the, with the greatest amount of activity out there. So our next trip was Wednesday, February 28. Now, on our first trip, I had gathered together about seven or eight friends, and we caravanned out there and saw nothing, of course. Then I started organizing the same group of friends to make this second trip. But this time it was in the middle of the week. And lo and behold, when it came close to the time to depart, we found out that none of our friends could make it. Work weeknight. So Pearl says, boy, I don't think I want to go out there all alone. I said, oh, don't be ridiculous, dear. I said, we obtained this information off radio, KVEG, clear in Santa Monica, being broadcast from Las Vegas. I said, there are people all over the western states that are hearing this. We have a tangential interest in UFOs at this point. Think of the people that have a voracious interest in the subject. You're going to have people going out there from all over, and I'm sure the word is spreading to other countries of the world. You'll probably have people out there from Australia and Europe and all over the map to say nothing of the people from Las Vegas close by. I said, there could be scores, even hundreds of people out there. Don't be ridiculous. So we went out there. We were all alone. I was actually outraged. Well, anyway, we got out there. And I believe we arrived around 3.30 at the mailbox. And we decided to go to the Little Alien for dinner. And we came back and got to the mailbox by about 5.30. It was, beginning, it was dusk and beginning to get dark. <clears throat> Wednesday, February 28, 1990, and <clears throat> I got out my lawn chair, and suddenly at 7.30, the first craft came up, and I was astounded. I leaped out of my lawn chair, had a camera around my neck, my 35-millimeter point-and-shoot camera, Nikon Action Touch, and I took a couple of shots, and then we actually, about every 45 minutes, a craft would come up, one at a time. We had, we saw six craft that night, each one in succession. And it was craft number about two or three that was, was the most dramatic. That is, it was the one that came the closest, and I took a photograph of it. What we actually saw, Michael, was a craft that was ellipsoidal in shape. It was pulsating brightly, and while we couldn't see the outline of the craft, the strict outline, we saw this very brightly pulsating ellipsoid and when I snapped some shots, apparently the camera, with its low-end optics, that is, we didn't have a huge 
magnifying lens, so it didn't bring the craft in so close that it would have appeared as a giant blur of light. <coughs> so, <coughs> plus, it must have caught the craft in a trough of its pulse, because the photograph captured the craft beautifully. That is the outline of it. So it was just a, a fluke of being at the right place at the right time and <laughs> having the right optical setup. Going to Bloom Lake Area 51, what happened to you on this night? Well, on that night, February the 21st, 1990, I took, uh, accompanied a crew from Nippon Television Network uh, to witness the a test flight of an object over Groom Lake, which is known as Area 51. We arrived at the site around just after sundown because according to the information given to us on that same day when we visited Mr. Lazar at his residence, he said that if you go there after sundown and stand near the mailbox area of Highway 375, looking south towards Groom Mountains and also to the Jumble Hills, you will see test flight of these objects. And lo and behold, when we arrived at the scene, exactly around 6.45 or so, we started seeing, and uh, we suddenly started seeing an orangish, yellowish uh, light uh, suddenly appear on top of jumbled hills and making a motion to the right for about uh, 15 seconds or so. Next, exactly at 8.15 p.m., we had another sighting of an, the same object that suddenly appeared on top of jumbled hills, came up above the hills and uh, uh, made its appearance went slightly to the right side and at that juncture in time it made a sudden dissension and a back turn which I estimated to be uh, possibly about 5,000 feet sudden dissension, a back turn dissension and I had never seen anything like that in my life ever and it is definitely a uh, test fight of highly unusual uh, object, a demonstration of technology, a propulsion system so exotic right now. That we don't know what it was, but it was being tested at that very night. Well, I've become probably the expert on Area 51 in the United States since uh, February 26th of 1991, which was my first trip out to Area 51. On that trip, I got as close as I have ever gotten to a flying saucer. It was the first time I'd ever seen a UFO, actually. I was traveling in a car with, with my friend down the road, and a very large object flashed over the car and then began to float probably about a mile away from us in the open desert. We got out of the car, ran towards the object, and got within a few hundred yards of a large disc-shaped object about uh, 40 feet in diameter that looked like a, uh, a saucer with a teacup at the, on the top of it. It glowed a brilliant reddish-orange color and then glowed a real bright yellow color. Uh, on one occasion we thought that the object was actually going to explode because it glowed so brilliantly it would shoot up to about 200 feet in the air, make a falling leaf motion back and forth and then go back down onto the ground. Um, this object was uh, was amazing. I was so excited because I'd never seen anything before like this ever in my life. We got our faces burned. We had a mild case of radiation poisoning after that. Uh, we had fevers for three or four days of about 102, 103 degrees, which we felt was radiation poisoning. And since then, I've been out to the Area 51 area uh, probably some 40, 50 times or so and have take, taken quite literally hundreds of people out there. We had gone to a place called Rachel where there was supposed to have been this gathering of people, uh, one of which I had heard on the radio in Los Angeles, and that's what seemed so intriguing. We passed this large group of people in the middle of nowhere out in the desert. There was a tour bus and probably 24 cars or so. It, 
just in the middle of nowhere, total darkness. We went on by them and went into Rachel. We, we stayed there for about 45 minutes, just listening to the conversation going on and decided that the place to be was probably the group of people that we had passed about 15 miles back. We went there and sat and began watching like it seemed everyone else was doing. And then we had the first actual sighting. I, would, I looked up in the sky and I thought there was a really bright star up there. And I said, John, is that star kind of moving? And right about the same time I saw that, and he goes, yeah, I think it is. And right about that time, it just like, like a falling star dropped out of the sky and, and, and just came straight down to the, right above the, a mountain range that was about five miles away from us. And, and just stopped there and hovered and then, and, and then moved around the mountains a little bit, making various maneuvers that no aircraft could possibly make. And uh, then it just it didn't just stop, and then it and then it lowered itself down below the mountains out of view, and that was the the, the first of uh, many weird things we saw that night. And uh, the the people on the bus were there at that time. They they got all applauded like, oh, there was a sighting, and uh, and it was getting late. It was about one. Well, it was not even quite midnight then, and they uh, so they all kind of applauded and said, well, that's there, and they all got in the bus and left. Did you recognize any details? Not at that time. Not at that time. It, that that uh, particular sighting was completely on the other side of this large valley that was at least uh, 15, 20 miles across uh, at the, the point of where, where we saw it come down and float across the valley. Yeah. The most dramatic thing that happened that evening was uh, after every, a large number of the people had, had left, including the tour bus, it was down to three cars, and we were sitting in the middle of these three cars, and had been watching a light maneuvering uh, kind of wildly out on the other side of the valley and were just intrigued as it came straight toward us as if it was singling out uh, Jeff and I in particular yeah. from, from this lo lo immense distance away in a straight line. And there was a car on the other side, uh, uh, on our right side, that had the dome light on and they were making sandwiches. They didn't see this happen. Yeah, there was a car was totally on the left side. Was going on. They didn't see it happen. They had the seats down and I think they were making out. Yeah. And we were absolutely stunned. Uh, I, I felt absolutely awestruck as this light that we had been watching came straight, straight toward us. us. In just an instant, it crossed that long valley and and uh, came right Jeff became us. actually frightened because uh, we're, right sitting at, we're sitting in a pickup truck and I'm looking right over, right up like this and it stopped and hovered practically right over us. And, uh, and then it turned on a light from the, from the uh, edge of the craft. And I mean, and when it came over us and stopped and hovered, the light seemed to be on the top of it and it revealed like a silhouette of a disc. And you clearly say it was a, it was a disc shaped craft and it made no noise whatsoever, just hovering above us, you know, probably maybe what, under 100 feet in, you know, in altitude above us? Yeah. Yeah. And it stayed there and hovered for a few seconds more, and that's when I was starting to get worried, you know, that something else is going to happen now. Now that they checked us out, maybe they're going to land, or, you know, I didn't know what was going to go on, so I got, I got pretty scared at that point. And right about the same time I got scared, uh, the thing just zoomed back over the mountains. And, I mean, you're, you're talking about, like, oh, what was it, 10 you know, five, five, eight, ten miles, and within a split second, it was over this mountain range, and then, and then stopped, and then just lowered itself on the other side of the range, out of, out of sight. We have to understand one fact that Area 51 is has three tiers of security systems: the outer perimeter security, the inner security, and also the regular military security plus automated security system. And we're talking about outer perimeter security. Area 51 is using semi-private security firms such as Wackenhut Corporation. We call them Wackenhut SS because basically it's the way they operate. Wackenhut SS, of course, means Wackenhut Special Securities Corporation, of course and they are assigned to guard the outer perimeters of Area 51. And they, because of the status of being a semi-private status, they don't wear any insignias 
of any kind. They wear military camouflage uniforms and carry machine guns and so on. They ride unmarked uh, four-wheel blazer type vehicles and they, they harass citizens who even dare to drive on any of these dirt roads south of the Highway 375. We have every right to be driving on these public lands as long as we don't cross the warning sign area. We were harassed by dangerously maneuvering helicopter over public land on May 16, 1991. A group of us, all together, 18 of us, were in a seven-car caravan just coming back on Groom Road after taking pictures of the warning sign area. We were coming back to Highway 375. But suddenly, we heard a roar, thunderous sound overhead, as if a railroad was tr passing over our cars. When we looked out up, there was this military helicopter that appeared and came about eight, five to eight feet above our cars on purpose, harassing us, intimidating us, and for the next 15 to 16 minutes, we were trying to get away from this, this helicopter. We were tra frantically trying to drive and go away from this area, and we were buzzed by this helicopter continuously for 15 minutes. In one occasion, this helicopter circled around as we were driving and came front of our cars at almost low level and just scared us and continued this illegal uh, maneuvering, endangering our lives. Where is it? Where is it? There it is. It's, it went behind the mountain. There it is. There it is. I had to put the gain on just to see it. Boy, am I better? Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> Fortunately, I, this isn't doing me any good. Yeah. Who's that, Gary? Come shut up. The UFO, which yet was filmed by the Japanese television crew that night, was analyzed by Nippon Television with the help of later state-of-the-art computers. The result? 
It's definitely no conventional aircraft. Yeah, it was upset for us. Hitachi Shuzai Han was filmed by a computer camera. The area of 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 the 比較することができるこれはその光の明るさが時間によってどのように変化するかを大きさで示したものでヘッドライトの場合かなり変化するものということがわかる一方エリア51で撮られた光る物体は常に同じ大きさで明るさが変わらないやはり普通の物体とは全く違うものなのではないだろうか But also around Las Vegas, unknown flying objects are regularly observed. Uh, I took my wife to work one morning, and uh, on the way back, I was looking out the windows I usually do, and I carry my camera with me quite often. And uh, I saw this anomaly, this UFO in the sky, and so I stopped my car and pulled out and uh, uh, took some footage of it, which is what you're looking at now, I guess. <laughs> That's about it. And it came on two different mornings, as a matter of fact. So on two different mornings, I took pictures of it. This was in 1991, and uh, it was, uh, actually, we've seen a lot of things around Las Vegas here. It's a great area to spot UFO objects. I've seen cigar-shaped UFOs, I've seen uh, the regular discs, and uh, I've seen anomalies of all styles and types around here. I've spent many a night, all night, uh, up looking for uh, UFO uh, things in the sky. One morning when I woke up, I was drawing the curtains of the window and it was a cloudy day, but clear. And two, they looked just like bowler hats. Dull gray, uh, no windows, no wheels, no nothing. Just looked like a bowler hat, metal, definitely metal. Uh, there was two of them. One was flying in a steady fashion. And the other one, it looked like the pilot was drunk. <laughs> because it was, uh, it was just flying this way. And they went down behind some apartments which were only about 100 yards away from me. That I was impressed with. I told my wife about it and she gave me a strange look. And two weeks to the day, she was at the same window, and saw the same things and called me at work. And she was gibbering away and I was, yeah. And from then on, we'd seen quite a few. I spent a lot of time out in the desert with my camera and I got rather obsessed with it for a while. But uh, as you'll see in some of the other footage of what I've got, uh, it's quite interesting and it's definitely unexplained. It happened when I was at work, it was a Sunday, and it was close to seven o'clock. And for some reason I just took my camera to the parking garage roof and started filming uh, what you see here, which are two remote type objects sort of dancing around. And uh, in a little while you'll see another craft come along underneath. It's a little larger and it's very stable and it's going steadily heading north. Uh, these two which are dancing around seem to interact with it and then it goes on its way. A few minutes later, another craft comes along the base part of the mountain, and uh, 
In between that, an aeroplane going in to land at McCarran Airport goes past, so you get a good idea of the size and uh, the distance. And then these two objects again interact with this large craft. And uh, as you'll see towards the end of the tape here, I follow it around to see where the craft went to, and um, it's totally out of sight, it's vanished. Do you recognize more details when visible? No, not really, no. It was just close to dusk. Um, they were just lights in the sky. It's it, it slightly uh, delta-shaped, I think, the objects are. Uh, that's how they appear anyway, when I zoom in. Obviously, the Lazar UFOs were just the tip of an iceberg. A black world, as fantastic as a fairy tale country or a faraway planet. Yet, committed researchers tried to trace down the last mystery of these super secret test flights. By looking at the maps and by discussing things, not only with the sheriffs, but also with uh, uh, friends of mine, I found a mountain top in which you can actually climb to the top of the mountain, and it's about an hour and a half hike or so, it's uh, about seven miles, to the top of a mountain which we call Morton's Mountain, since I was the one that first found it, climb up to the top of the mountain, and this is where you get this spectacular view of virtually the entire base. You can see this particular video was taken at night, so uh, because of the fact that we were very afraid of being caught out there still during the day, because we weren't really sure whether or not we were over the military's border or not. At about 6 a.m. every morning, they were sending helicopters out, literally chasing us around if we were anywhere near their border. And the evening times, they would send out the security vehicles, the, the Bronco security vehicles, who would do everything from take down our license plate numbers to actually go through our cars to looking for us in the desert, thinking that we were actually stepping across their border. This videotape comes from our efforts literally risking our lives at that time to be able to get a good view inside this probably one of the most top secret facilities the United States has above ground. Uh, specifically what you're looking at is you're looking at uh, Area 51 at night taken in the uh, 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 taken at around dusk. You're also looking at a, another section of the video which was work that looks like was going on on the runway. Now for some reason the military was carrying out some kind of either construction operation at night. Now there seems to be a huge halogen lamp that's illuminating part of the field in which you'll see smaller lights which are trucks and, and jeeps basically coming and going from this light. You'll see on the film what we thought originally was a ship actually coming on and testing and moving around on the on the, the floor of the valley. Uh, it didn't really move that much at night, so that's why we concluded that it must have been some sort of halogen work lamp. You'll see for the first time the object which is called Old Faithful. Now Old Faithful is called that because something appears in the sky over Area 51 at 4.50 a.m. virtually every Thursday morning. Now many times this object is preceded by what in California have become known as skyquakes. There is a very large object which we've witnessed out there between seven and eight hundred feet long and this object literally comes in from space traveling anywhere between Mach 10 and about Mach 18, flies over Catalina Island, over Southern California, and then lands at Area 51. This particular object that you're seeing, we theorize, is what's known as Project Senior Prom, which is underneath the Project Aurora banner, and that this object is in fact an unmanned uh, 132 nuclear weapon carrying nuke platform that in essence orbits the planet to be able to rain down nuclear bombs on virtually any country at the push of a button. This object as it's landing you'll see it appear in the sky, very dramatic footage of the first time any, anything has ever been shot actually physically landing at 51. The object appears at exactly 4.50 a.m. comes down in a conventional flight pattern. Now sometimes this object will shake back and forth violently, dis displaying all the characteristics of a, quote, conventional UFO, unquote. And uh, on this particular occasion, it comes all the way down in a, in a very straight line. You'll see a field around the outside of the object, and when it comes down between two safety lights, you'll see it actually physically land, and then when it comes past a second set of safety lights, the field around the ship actually blinks off, and then you can see that it is some sort of unusual dart-shaped, uh, uh, aircraft, some sort of experimental aircraft, because it does have wheels on it, and it does appear to have a, 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 a fuselage 
that is comes up in a point with a light at the top and at the bottom and then comes back at the uh, at the bottom. So it is a very unusual ship and this particular ship was in fact preceded by one of the famous Southern California skyquakes. Rachel is a small desert nest at the Highway 375, which passes the Black World. Its inhabitants are mainly workers of the test site. Rachel's main attraction is the Little Ale Inn, the local grill and beer bar owned by Pat and Joe Dravers, which became the main information exchange for Area 51 enthusiasts from all over the world. It not only exhibits UFO memorabilia, it also houses a library and a large collection of newspaper articles about secret government experiments documenting that the greatest secret of our time actually is no secret anymore. Aviation expert and writer Jim Goodall was one of the first who lifted the veil of silence. I am a published author. I've written for three different publications. Uh, I, I have a number of articles on black programs and secret projects for Jane's Defense Weekly, for Interavia, for uh, Aviation Week Space Technology. Um, I have three books right here that I have authored just on the F-117 alone. Uh, that, is my, that is where I spend all my spare time is digging. I've had my neighbors questioned, I've had my mail opened, I've had my phones tapped. I was called up for Desert Shield, for, I mean I'm in the Air National Guard. They held up my clearance at the Pentagon. They didn't deny my clearance, they held it up because I asked too many questions of my government. And my response was, that is my job. As an American taxpayer, it's my job to question my government whenever I feel it fit, and I do. And I make a lot of enemies, and, I, and I, I'm referred to as that SOB from Minnesota. Uh, I have a, quite a reputation in the Pentagon for being able to dig up information when no one else can. What's going on in Area 51 today, uh, based on information from first-person interviews I've made over the last six or seven years, there are at least eight black programs flying out of Groom Lake, out of Area 51. That does not include, it does not count the B-2 bomber because it's not a black program. It does not count the F-117, which is a virtually a, a white program today. There are at least two very, very high-speed aircraft that are have been reported for since 1982 is when we've heard the first reports of them. One of them is a small aircraft. It goes approximately Mach 4 to Mach 6. There's an aircraft that has been tracked out of the Bay Area Tracon in Oakland, California by the Federal Aviation Administration Center oh, at least eight times since 1986 flying in excess of 10,000 miles an hour going through controlled airspace and a very, very large aircraft at that. Besides the two high-speed aircraft, there is a stealth or low observable electronic warfare aircraft. It's been referred to as Excalibur. There is an aircraft that is designed to fly very, very high, but very, very slow and very, very quiet. Uh, there's been some rumblings or reports as a flying triangle, much like the canceled McDonnell Douglas General Dynamics A-12 of um, that was going to be an attack aircraft. Just recently out of Lancaster, California taken off from Palmdale which is Air Force Plant 42 and that's where the B-1 was built 
the V-2 bomber is being built there, the F-117 is being serviced there, and the U-2 operations. There has been at least three sightings of triangular-shaped aircraft being launched out of that area. They made no noise, and just the people just happened to look up and see these things leaving the, uh, the area at relatively low altitude, but again, no noise. Are there any unconventional technologies, propulsion technologies involved? Yes, I have uh, <clears throat> had the opportunity over the years to interview, again, people who have worked at the test site at Groom Lake. Uh, one gentleman spent 12 of his 30 years in black programs at Groom Lake. When I asked him, I said, uh, first of all, I said, do you believe in UFOs? And he looked at me with a straight face in one-on-one, -on -one, he said, absolutely, positively, they do exist. So can you expand upon that? And he said, no, I can't. About a year later, we were talking about, again, activities at Groom Lake. And I asked him, I said, you know, can, can, can you really let me tell me what's happening out there? And he said, well, there's a lot of things that are going on there that I won't be able to tell you until, until the year 2025. But we have things in the Nevada desert that would make George Lucas envious. Another individual who was a, an NCO, an E-9, uh, which is a the highest grade you can get as an enlisted man, he's a chief master sergeant in the Air Force, was a safety specialist. He had three different tours of duty at Groom Lake on various programs. Now he had no connection with my, my, my friend who worked on the other black, other black programs. We were talking, I interviewed him at Nellis in 1985, 86 time frame. And I said, what's out there? And again, he, he, look, he looked me straight in the eye and he says, we have things out there that are literally out of this world. I said, explain. He said, I can't. But trust me, he said, we have things that are, that we, that, that are better than Star Trek, better than, than anything you can see in the movies. He said, are the airplanes? He said, I can't comment. There's four levels in Science 4, excluding the top level, the surface which is basically a hangar, hangars uh, with the satellite. There's really not too much to it, but the levels are all operators. The first and second levels are all elevator where they keep the flying disc. Ships, whatever you call it. They bring it to the surface. Right when I was there, they were trying to operate the disc, but to my viewing, unsuccessfully. There's scientists there, there's, I mean, I have personally witnessed high White House officials being there. <coughs> right now I'm basically kind of scared, I mean, I'm on the run. I, I don't know what uh, everything holds for me. I just want to get this out in the open. A security guard at level two of S4 in area 51, and he described area, S4 as a facility occupying at least four levels. He was aware of four. He worked on level two. He had passed through level one. He never saw level three or level four because no military people were allowed below those levels. Only very people with very specific clearances could go to level three and level four. He described level two in considerable detail to us, and he said level two consisted of nine hangar bays, I guess you would call them, because they were the size, they would hold a small airplane. And there were circular disc-shaped craft in seven of the nine bays. He described the floor layout, he described the security posts, the guard positions, a, an area where bodies were stored in large glass cylinders. He described uh, special equipment, he, he described the monitoring equipment, uh, the security system to go down to levels three and four, he said that they were never allowed down there, only specially cleared people with very specific clearances, which included, at least, included a plastic card with magnetic information in it, a handprint, and a right eye retina scan, and put their eye to a little camera. And if they passed, uh, they could go down. If not, their instructions were to arrest them immediately and have somebody from above come down and get them. Big place, huh? Big place. 
the elevators are right here. There's four elevators. Three and four are extreme, extremely security. There are no sentries down at three or four. And the levels of three and four, I don't know what goes on down there. I heard something about an EB or EB down there. I'm not too familiar with what it is, but as you get off the elevators, you get off and this is level two. You walk in, the bays are over here. They're all separated by like an automatic doors that open and close each bay. Walk down, there's five. Five on each side. There's a hallway right there, and they can. Each of these bays have elevators. It'll bring them all the way to the top. It'll bring the whole floor all the way up with a hydraulic system. Now, as you walk down, there's a lot of machinery right here, which I have no recollection of what it does. I believe it's. I've never been in that area. My job was to censure, be a sentry for these three gates and up above in the level complex and sometimes I would be walking down here escorting people. Now over on this, there's a hallway down here that breaks off which is a lot of, there's a big computer system right here. I believe it's a computer system. I'm not going to say for sure. Right here is a level of seven tubes. These tubes are about two feet in width. They're about six feet in height. They stand on end. They stand on end on end. And now, as you walk in and you look at these tubes, I'm just gonna go push a one. They're all exactly the same. The end, uh, the human, the the creatures inside are completely identical. There is absolutely no way that I can see of identifying each and every one of them individually. Now there's an aluminum part right here. I don't know if it's covering the uh, genitals of them or not, but the rest is filled with the solution. There's a couple tanks right here. I don't know if they're oxygen. I don't know what they hold. There's no identifying marks on them whatsoever. There's no, absolutely no air in the tanks. It's all solution. And uh, the grays are, are, are just in here, right here. They're suspended, so I imagine they're being clamped somehow, some way to hold them in this complete, where their feet is completely off the ground and stuff like that. And under here, there's about a one foot pedestal of, uh, <clears throat> black iron steel like uh, it's really it's polished but it's, it looks like a black polished anodized iron now the things inside I mean resemble what everybody sees and uh, The only thing that's different about them from what I see on all the pictures is that the eyes appear to be a, a deteriorated or they're, they look like prunes. They're uh, like your fingers get pruned. They're all shriveled up and you can't see no eye socks and there's no visible eyelids or anything like that. They have a grayish like uh, a grayish pigmentation it's not scaly or anything it's like a pigmentation there's no apparent hair on them there's little holes uh, not really slits but a, a little hole maybe an ear car is that one that you're hearing slits are really kind of small for the nose and the mouth the bodies themselves 
are very, very thin. They don't, they appear not to have any breast or navel or anything like that. Not that I can see. Yeah. I've done, I mean, I wasn't able to sit and study them in, in full view for a while. But they, I mean, I don't think I have heard talk there that I know their systems aren't like ours. But they're very thin and they look very, very frail. What convinced you that Tennessee told you the truth? We, we only have, uh, looking him in the eye and talking to him, we've, we've, we've analyzed his voice during the narration. Doesn't show any signs of stress. Uh, we've, he we've heard rumors of some details inside from others that has never been released or published. So unless they were on the inside circle and, and knew what was being held back, most people would never know the information that he gave us. Most of the information that he gave us checked with other information we already had. And it has checked since with other information that we have acquired since the time we interviewed him. Mr. Bolton, you came in contact with the sergeant who worked at Area 51. Yes, I was on an American television program called Mysteries from Beyond the Other Dominion, and at the end of the program they gave my telephone number. This gentleman contacted me through that telephone number and related to me that he was in fact a master sergeant at Area 51 for over 12 years, and that everything that had to be taken in and out of the base or transported from one place to another on the facility had to go across his desk. Of course, the man had a very high-level top-secret clearance. He gave me his name, he gave me a military ID number which I was able to check and his military ID did in fact check out that he had worked at Nellis Air Force Base and had then worked at the Area 51 facility. He told me a number of very interesting things about how the facility was laid out, how many levels the facility had, how it was connected to other facilities and he asked me a number of questions about things that he didn't really know about, just stuff that he had seen going across his desk and was curious about how certain things work. So there was a, an exchange of information between he and I. Uh, it is unfortunate that he seems to have disappeared. Um, he seems to have moved with no forwarding address. His telephone number no longer works. I was in contact with him for quite a period of time, and then the man simply vanished. Did he ever see um, the alien spaceship or alien bodies? On many occasions, he told me, uh, Chip is what he called himself, that he had in fact transported uh, disc-like saucers, what he considered to be alien spacecraft. And he, remember, he was not sure if they were alien or not. He never saw the actual paperwork on the craft. He was only responsible for transporting the objects from place to place. However, he did transport a number of very large 30 to 60 foot disc-shaped craft. Uh, he was responsible for transporting uh, some bell-shaped objects. He said when they were at rest that they were a very dull gunmetal color. He did, in fact, witness on a number of occasions the tests of these craft because they would have to cart them out to a certain place and then they'd take them off and then the, uh, the objects would then fly around. And he was asking me how something that looked so dead and so lifeless could then glow up the way that it did and, and the metal on the ship would actually look as though it was alive. As far as the alien bodies were concerned, he told me that Area 51 had five underground levels to it. This was confirmed by three other sources that I had at the facility. He also claimed that there were not only living aliens on the base that he not only saw because he was responsible for transporting them physically by jeep from one place to another, but also uh, that he saw a number of alien bodies in very large tanks that the tanks had a silver backing to them, that they had a silver strips across the middle and the bottom of the tank. Uh, they were filled with a blue liquid. He said that he personally saw five different tanks that had these alien bodies in them, the classic little gray bodies, the three and a half to four feet tall, but that they also had four humanoid aliens that were uh, had blondish and reddish hair, um, very little was unusual about them that would uh, demarcate them from actual humans, but he was told that these were actual 
alien bodies supposedly, and this was his speculation now, but he said that they were supposedly from the Pleiades. There are many underground uh, alien facilities and they're all over the place. Uh, there's also many underground U.S. facilities. Uh, in 1960, it became apparent uh, to the military that if they were going to have any significant covert operations, they were going to have to be underground. The reason was people are extremely observant. They notice everything that's going on. And if there was going to be huge transportation of materials, men, equipment, all kinds of stuff, that it was going to be uh, have to be underground. There was a major meeting with all the major uh, uh, contractors, the big contractors like um, Morrison Knudsen and, and those type of people. Uh, and the meeting included the, uh, the highly specialized area of underground uh, uh, operations as far as drilling down there, how you move that kind of dirt. And they started then, basically in 1960, building all these underground facilities. Uh, right now, uh, they're just all over the United States. It's just incredible how many there are. Uh, there's a network of tunnels that uh, connects Edwards Air Force Base uh, with the Tehachapi Base, with Tonopah Test Range, Groom Lake, George Air Force Base, California City, uh, China Lake. Uh, it's a tremendous uh, network. Uh, I have varied and many uh, uh, people who have told me uh, that they exist, that they have been down there. Uh, I have a friend that uh, is a hydraulic engineer on one of the tunnel boring machines. It's 28 feet in, in diameter. He works at the Nevada test site where the uh, tunnels go down almost 3,000 feet. In addition to this, I have had a number of ex-military persons, uh, engineers who've worked in the aerospace industry uh, for the aerospace companies out in the Antelope Valley such as Lockheed, Northrop, uh, Rockwell who have related to me their knowledge of underground facilities. Not in all cases have they revealed what they knew about alien life forms or alien technology, but they said that these underground facilities exist without a doubt. Okay, that many aeroscape space companies have these facilities, that most of our Air Force bases, our naval bases, have these type of facilities underground, and that ultra secret work goes on in secure underground facilities. Now, our difficulty has been in trying to come up with the evidence that these facilities are connected with the UFO phenomena. So we have had to approach this not only from the viewpoint of listening to testimony, but keeping some of these facilities under surveillance so that we can take cameras up there or any means that we can uh, to record phenomena that seem to be emanating from or associated with these facilities. And that has been done. And people have reported seeing classic UFO phenomena around these facilities. There are four aerospace covert facilities. This is what we call the aerospace connection in the Antelope Valley and also the San Joaquin Valley. Rockwell in the San Joaquin, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, and Northrop in the Antelope Valleys. And these operations are extremely suspicious. They have a surface cover activity. They call themselves RCS testing sites. That stands for radar cross-section. And apparently their presumed purpose is to test various aeroform designs atop pylons with radar cross-section. And the disturbing part is that we have found out with incontrovertible proof that there are extensive underground facilities. And for example, Northrop we have documented to have 42 levels underground. Now if this is radar cross-section testing, which is above ground, why do they need 42 levels underground? Also, at the Lockheed facility out in Hellendale, we had an investigative reporter who saw a blueprint of the 
building plans for that facility that he wasn't supposed to see. It showed that they had an extensive underground facility 300 feet down. And when this in reporter interviewed the person who was in charge of that facility, they had a nice, pleasant interview until at the end he told the director that he was aware of this extensive underground facility. And what could he tell him about that? And immediately the man's eyes grew wide and he said, this interview is terminated. So it's very suspicious. <clears throat> and then, of course, we have other reports of people in the area who say that they have seen alien craft emanating from these facilities and terminating at these facilities. <clears throat> and other kinds of blue beams, strange lights in the sky, surveillance orbs, size of basketballs, medicine balls that survey the area and move in ways that we don't possess that kind of technology. In terms of the Northrop facility, which is also known as the Ant Hill, <clears throat> the construction, the underground facility was greatly enlarged in the early 80s. And what took place there was an enlargement, I understand, from 13 levels underground to 42 levels underground. <clears throat> And we have reports from construction workers who actually worked on the site, cement truck drivers. And at one point, Michael, cement trucks suddenly appeared on the scene five miles long, pouring concrete continuously 24 hours a day, seven days a week for weeks. And we figure at three yards of concrete, excuse me, nine yards of concrete per truck, close to a million yards of concrete must have been poured underground. Also, we understand from the construction workers that three silos were constructed there, three underground silos, and we were bringing out the fact that saucers have been seen to just come screaming out of the facility as if they had had some travel distance underground. And, and yet, and also craft would, like helicopters, would come into the facility and just disappear into the ground. So we knew from construction reports and from visual reports outside the facility that something very suspicious in the way of silos was going on. Norio and I put together the first investigative team to actually fly over these facilities and investigate them from the air with video cameras, still camera shots. It was very exciting. And on our first flyover of the Northrop facility, we spent about an hour in the air on that trip. <clears throat> it was historic. You can imagine that my heart practically jumped out of my mouth when we're flying over and the pilot unsolicited says to me, by the way, there are three silos down there. Now I had learned from my inside contacts that three silos had been constructed there. And I was looking for those silos the minute we appeared over the facility. I was intensely looking for three silos, didn't see any, and suddenly the pilot says to me, but I just told you. I was shocked. I tried to contain my excitement and I pretended to be rather casual about it and I said, I'm sorry, I, I beg your pardon, but did you say silos down there? And he says, oh yes. He says, you see those white diamonds? And sure enough, there were three white diamonds. Now this pilot, you must understand, we rented the plane in the Antelope Valley, so he flies that area continuously. He has students, he's a, a pilot instructor. <clears throat> so he's flying over there all the time. He told me that on numerous occasions when, when he's flown over these facilities, those white diamonds, the white covering, will be gone to reveal a deep, dark hole or silo into the ground. Not only the black projects, but deep black projects program that is taking place about 10 miles south of Groom Lake. Groom Lake facility, of course, is a black projects program uh, that that is, technologically speaking, not uh, in line with higher technolo technology that is present uh, 10 miles south, which is located on Papoose Lake facility. That is where a new type of propulsion system is being test flown, and again, it's my contention that some select U.S. pilots 
are being given instructions on maneuvering these objects. Uh, we have, from all types of reports and sources, uh, this established this one fact, is that there is some type of uh, pumpkin seed program. This is a, a nickname of a new type of propulsion system using pulse detonation uh, system. And this is known as the pumpkin seed program because these objects are, they have uh, almost like a diamond shaped uh, the form to this. Now, this is part of the Black Projects program. However, what I've been investigating is more than that. It's the super deep Black Projects program, which could possibly involve technology much higher than this type of pro pulse propulsion system, uh, which could be antimatter or some type of anti uh, matter as Mr. Lazar has been stating. The sources of our information are not only from uh, researchers that have received a lot of infos through aerospace connection. Uh, the, we have been in touch with several persons that confirm that Black Project program is ongoing at Groom Lake facility, uh, Papoose Lake facility, plus other facilities such as in California. The Northrop, uh, McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed, all of these facilities are conducting some type of uh, testing of certain type of aeroforms that resemble almost uh, a disc. And it's possible, very possible, that the technology behind this could be uh, received by from some uh, intelligence, not necessarily uh, us. In other words, we're talking about something uh, possible, transfer of technology. After I had, uh, of course, uh, got out of the service, I worked uh, uh, for the government, you know, as a test uh, pilot on various different uh, particular aircraft. While I did that, particular activity, the, uh, I was asked if I wouldn't <clears throat> mind uh, working on some simulators, and I thought that was a good idea, good for my future, so I did. We, uh, uh, we were then reassigned, it was just not myself, it was several other fellows like myself, engineers, that uh, were reassigned to certain companies here in the United States on the various different simulators that, were, that they were making for uh, the various new aircrafts that they were building. <clears throat> For example, you know, the F-89, F-94, uh, and F-102, and a, and, a, and a group of others. We spent uh, probably close to three and a half, four years just in training on simulators, and uh, just exactly, you know, how a simulator, a, an actual simulator for these aircraft worked, you know, and, and the new designs as they came along. After they thought that we were trained sufficiently, then uh, we were asked to do uh, another project, which was more or less, in my field, as mechanical design. Uh, that was to uh, uh, join metal together without glue, nuts, you know, or any adhesives, so forth, you know, uh, for aircraft purposes. To the, ind the indication was was to make the aircraft uh, lighter. Okay. <clears throat> this, this of course, is uh, several years going on. In the meantime, of course, security classifications were going on, you know, as far as we were concerned and just the individuals that were going to work on these particular projects before going to the, to the actual facility where I had done this activity. We uh, uh, developed this particular process of joining this material. It took quite some time, over a period of about four years. And then it was indicated to us that we'd go on a, a special project uh, in New Mexico, which we did. And it was about three or four years after we had gotten there that we found out that uh, these were simulators for, that we would be engineers on simulators for flying disks. 
there was uh, one particular project they worked on uh, associated with that disc was several years, of course. It, it's very time consuming in a translation of uh, scientific data as provided to us by the uh, grays, a specific type of gray. Uh, as this information would, was given to our scientists and various different engineers that we had no association with, but they were doing what they call a copy engineering. The copy engineering was uh, a process where they had taken an item or a, a part, portion of the craft and they were disassembling it, writing their procedures and identifying certain things as they took it apart and how it related to from their science to our science and could we use that. I uh, <clears throat> spoke in a little lecture here a while back that no average pilot could fly a flying this because it was so complicated and so foreign to the individual pilot that there would be no way that he'd be able to hop in one even if they gave it to him and said, here, fly this. Consequently, what we did, we took their avionics and transferred it to our science and our technology and used the avionics that we know of uh, as far as aircraft is concerned. Uh, the um, basic principles in all this, as far as the avionics was concerned, was no different than the than a, a regular aircraft that we have, if you understand that, uh, 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 say for example, a, a fighter, a fighter aircraft, it's it's much different than a flying disc. <clears throat> there were certain uh, uh, situations that we had to uh, resolve, and basically we only looked at a couple different things because the flying disc only flies in about three different positions and that is uh, uh, at 65 degrees, uh, flat horizontal and uh, possibly vertical. But it was very difficult to fly vertical. The avionics that we developed for that was for the 65 degrees pitch and yaw and uh, flat flight. Did you ever see a disc by yourself? I saw a disc from a distance. Can you describe Not it? Not up close. Can you describe it? Uh, if I was describing a disc uh, for you to, so you'd understand what we're looking at, if you did see the Bob Lazar poster, uh, very, very similar. This facility I've worked at is, 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 I'd say, as far as secrecy is concerned, is much uh, tighter than possibly even Nellis here and some of the other facilities, you know, in this country. Uh, the the entrance and the locations and the scenario on and say, hey guys, you know, here this is, you know, this is this is what the ship looks like. It's okay, that's what the ship looks like. As far as entering the ship, no. But that was a disc. How far away was it? Oh, well, I was uh, say ten or fifteen feet away. Was it flying or standing on the ground? It was just sitting on the ground, on its belly. What did you? feel in the moment when you saw it, what did you, what was the impression of it? I had, uh, my impression was, as an engineer, was just great. Have you ever seen any aliens? We were introduced to greys that had, were associated with the project, but they were, uh, uh, I could say that in the time that I spent, maybe I've seen the greys a half a dozen times or more, but uh, I, no more than ten times, I think. But they were on, uh, uh, the reason that we saw them was actually to, for us to get used to being associated with them, okay? It's no different than, say, going to Africa and seeing a bunch of pygmies and, you know, looking at those people for a while and then, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's it, this is a little different than that, but it's the same, same situation where you're seeing something that's a little bit different than us sitting in this room, you know, talking right now with their features and their makeup and that kind of thing. The conclusion that I have made from this uh, is kind of a tentative conclusion, and it's in several parts. Number one, the United States Air Force is interested in any foreign objects that are invading our skies. They would be foolish if they did not conduct a serious investigation 
of what appears to be superior technology in order to do an estimate of the situation. That's point number one. Number two is, over a period of time, they could have progressed quite far in this study of this technology. Far enough that I believe brings us around to point three, and that is you recruit your best minds uh, from where? The aerospace industry to work on highly classified or what they call black projects in order to see if we could duplicate or develop this technology for ourselves. Because what every military wants is superiority and advantage over the enemy. And of course this kind of technology would offer us an incredible advantage over almost any enemy, at least <laughs> that could be found on Earth. Was extraterrestrial technology already used for secret military projects? I think it's entirely possible. Uh, the sources I have say that that's the reason that we were studying alien hardware in the first place, wreckage from Roswell and other crash sites, is so we can figure how, how it worked and have a military advantage over our adversaries. Uh, could be the Black Manta, could be the Aurora, could be stealth technology. Uh, one of the things we learned in Russia is that they were studying UFOs for incorporation into their st stealth program, and they also studied UFOs for incorporation into their SDI program. So it was going on there, chances are very good that it was going on here as well. The, the piece of, of UFO lore or information that really sticks the closest to home was a letter from a very close friend of mine who wrote a letter to Ben Rich. Ben Rich is the retired president of the Lockheed Advanced Development Company, the people that brought you stealth, that brought you the SR-71, the U-2. Ben was asked, do you, in a letter, do you believe in UFOs? And he wrote back to my friend, that yes, both Kelly, referring to Kelly Johnson, the founder of the Skunk Works, and I are firm believers in UFOs. Well, this got John Andrews uh, very, very excited, so he wrote another letter back to Ben. He said, please explain, please clarify. You're talking about, we're talking about two categories of UFOs, both man-made and extraterrestrial. And Ben wrote back again on his letterhead, handwritten, which you, you, know, you have a, a copy of, saying, yes, we, you know, UFOs do exist, both man-made and extraterrestrial. And we refer to them as unfunded opportunities, and he underlines the UFO. Are these super-secret test flights with recovered UFOs for real? Do U.S. government scientists really investigate extraterrestrial technology? We wanted to find out the truth, test the claims. Following Bob Lazar's recommendation, we drove out to the Black World on December 2nd, 1992, together with an ABC television camera crew. First, we waited near the Black mailbox at the Groom Lake Access Road. Then, followed by a black unmarked Fort Branco of the Wackenhuth Special Security, we changed our location to the Campfire Hill, an elevation on the roadside closer to the base. It was a Wednesday night, and shortly after sunset, at about 6.15 p.m., the first mysterious flying objects appeared. Fall down, uh, stop blowing. You know a signal flare, military signal flare? Groupie, I got it on tape. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. I don't know. There it is. Heads up, there it is. I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit higher. Okay. Now it's gone.
flares, aerial maneuvers or test flights of extraterrestrial spacecraft, one thing is sure, their flight characteristics were more than unconventional. Our eyewitnesses were convinced. I saw, well, right over the horizon there, um, as most of us said so far, I saw a light come up over the horizon, probably uh, a few degrees over the horizon, and it, and it broke into uh, first two lights, then three lights, and then it seemed to string, string them all together, kind of like a pearl, a string of pearls or beads, and uh, there seemed to be a connection as the light jumped from one uh, position to the next and it was kind of an orange yellow color and uh, it seemed to be sort of swirling around at the same time it wasn't a, a straight directional thing it's just it's kind of like they were going like this a little bit you know the first thing that was interesting we saw along this ridge out here were a series of, um, of white blinking lights that seemed to be uh, as we looked through binoculars the same light or, or several lights that were moving real rapidly around the sky, blinking. Um, very unusual. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. The one that seems to be attracting the most attention is the one we saw out right. that direction that uh, had a strange color and seemed yeah. to split. Uh, describe that one for me. <clears throat> yeah, well, it was a, an orangish red light that um, <clears throat> was rather intense um, and it seemed to split off into different pieces at one point and uh, come back together again. And I think that was the most interesting aspect of that. Um, we've seen a lot of interesting things tonight. What uh, was that they saw in the skies above Nevada? We'll try and have some answers next. A big UFO convention came to an end in Las Vegas last night, and afterwards, naturally, some of the members went out in the desert to search for UFOs. A news crew went along, too, and sure enough, it wasn't long before a mysterious, unidentified object appeared. Not too surprising, somewhere up there, you see it, because this patch of desert is right near a military test site. This looked like no aircraft lights that any of these folks had ever seen. This was a bona fide UFO sighting. I, I think it was, yeah. And then UFO means unknown flying object, and this definitely was nothing I've ever seen before. Was it a bird? Was it a plane? Was it the Aurora, the <laughs> secret plane? We don't know. More to come, I'm sure, and the Air Force is not saying anything as usual. Hmm. Well, fascinating. You have a good weekend. Of course, all of you. Good night, everybody.